This episode of Yes But Why podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Download your free audiobook today at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. Amy Jordan, and this is Yes, But Why Podcast. Yeah. What's it feel like for you? Well, well, I'll tell you what it feels like. When you first start out, it feels like you're going to (laughs) die. And then... And then, you know, as you get your footing and you get funnier and funnier, it feels like such a, it's almost like a therapy and a release of uh, all this energy that, that you know, it's, it, you look forward to it. It's like a drug. Oh, so yeah. I, I, I love it. I love performing. I love, uh, I love the whole thing. That's you so know, cool. I like being alone up there. Uh, I've done improv. I kind of like improv too because then the whole thing doesn't fall on your shoulders. Right. Like if you're not funny, you're not funny as a group. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or if you're not funny, somebody could pick up you're not funny. Or if yeah. someone else is not funny, you can pick up their slack. But um, you like being alone, on your own, huh? Alone. Oh, you're. I'm up there on my own. Yeah. You love I've it. Done it so long now. I'm doing it over thirty years. So I kind of like like doing my my thing by myself. You know. Yeah. Well, you seem like a confident lady from what I've seen of your performances, you know, like not everybody has the gumption to just be doing, you know, stand up up on stage by themselves doing it. But have you always been so confident and, you know, like speaking your mind? Um, I've always spoke my mind. I've, I haven't always been confident. I, and still to this day, I'm not as confident as I portray on stage. Wow, you're um, great. <laughs> yeah, you know, you always have your doubts, you always have your fears, you always have all of that. But um, I'm as you get older, you tend to not care as much as you did when you were twenty or twenty five. Now I go on stage, I'm like, if they don't live, they don't live. I don't care, but they usually do because of this, <laughs> because you don't care, and they feel it. So they're like, this girl, this person's funny, or this guy's funny, or whatever. So you don't really have you don't really have the same kind of nerve you have when you first start your stand up career, you know. Yeah, totally. So, so, how did you get it started? Like, what was the first time that you um, did comedy? It doesn't even have to be stand up. It could be like the first play you did in like junior high or something. What was the first thing? I didn't do any of that. I wasn't into that. I was very outgoing and very loud in high school and I was always the leader and I was always like the one that was like all right well I'm taking everybody to breakfast with my dad's car today was cut in first second and third period so I was always the leader of the gang um so what happened was I moved out to Los Angeles to become a special effects make- special effects makeup artist so I went to school wow. and while we were in school for that year we would hang out at the comedy store every night and I would watch great comedians like Sam Kinnison, uh, Roseanne Barr at the time, Gary Shandling, a lot of them are dead now. Um, you know, uh, there were so many of them. Jace Clay was one of them. Um, Richard Pryor would come in. You know, he watched all these great comedians. Wow. And I was in awe. A guy named Rick Corso, very funny guy. Uh, I took a liking to him. He liked me. He was a young guy at the time. I was young. We kind of dated a little bit. So, but then I moved back to New York City, and he was in L.A. So we had like this long distance relationship. And I would meet him in Florida when he would do like um, the punchlines or the funny bones or whatever, and we'd hang out. And then while I was on the road with him a little bit, I was just so enamored with the whole business. That I said, I'm really supposed to be doing what he's doing. Wow. 
Well, that's awesome. Uh, what a great experience to be able to like see the road part. I mean, I'm sure from your point of view, it was really exciting. And maybe from his, he wasn't so excited about it anymore. But, you know, Correct. just traveling right. around and seeing all the shows, like I could see how that would soak right into you. How soon after yeah, that I mean, did I you get in? Well, I didn't. I didn't. So what happened was I was dating him. Uh, I would meet him in like a town and we'd do the show for the week. Because back then the comedy was from like Tuesday to Sunday or Monday to Sunday. But so you did the whole week. So I would hang out for a whole week and then I'd go back home, whatever, do my makeup work, whatever. Um, and then I just felt that that's where I belonged. I'm like, I can do this. But yet with all long distance relationships, it didn't work out. Great guy, love him to death. And then I decided to take a class in New York City and become a comic. But he never knew that. Cut to, I see him like 25 years later, and he can't believe I'm a comedian. And I said, well, you're the reason. <laughs> you're the reason that I decided I wanted to become a comedian. Wow. So he never even saw the, like, stand-up you until later. No. Wow. Until after I was already, Yeah. Pretty Man. interesting, right? That's kind of great, though, from, like, uh, talking to an ex-boyfriend point of view. Like, you were like, yeah, I'm pretty accomplished at this point. But it was nice that you gave him credit. That was nice of you. I definitely, there's a number of ex-boyfriends of mine I would not have given such credit to. <laughs> yeah, I, um, you know what? I give credit to what credit is due. And I, I always keep myself grounded on the ground and know where I came from because, um, I see a lot of comedians that get a little heat and they become like, they, they, I don't know if they can't handle it or if they become another person, but I've never, mm-hmm. ever felt like that. I've always, you know, most headliners or whatever won't talk to open mic comics. And I happen to love comedians. Yeah, there's a lot of that. You know what I mean? There's a lot of people thinking they're better than everybody else. I I wonder if it's like you were talking about how like you like being alone on stage and like I equate that with bravery, but you know, maybe not so much. But at the same time, like... I think some people equate it with like higher status, you know, they're like, Oh, I can be by myself. So I'm better. And then they, they hold that high status so intensely that it comes out in their like relationships with other comics. You you, you can't, you can't forget that you suck bad when you first started. So you can never (laughs) look down on anybody because you know what? Oh, you never should. Open mic or, yeah, right. Today's (laughs) open mic or small star. So, you know, that's how it works, you know? Yeah. No, absolutely. I, there are yeah. definitely people in my life too where, and it's always the surprising ones. You know what I mean? Like it's never the one guy who you're like, that's the one he's going to be famous. It's always some rando who you're like, what is going on with this kid? He's weird. And then he's famous in like three seconds. Oh man. Correct. <laughs> oh man. So you're in the thick of it. You're like in the midst of your career right now. How did you go from Los Angeles to New York? You started doing it. Um, I guess maybe you went to New York anyway. You said you were going to sci-fi school. How did you, or rather uh, sci-fi makeup school, uh, you dropped out of that and then became a comedian. How'd you get back to New York City? It seems like a rough crowd. Um, well, my family's from here, you know, from New York. Oh, right so, on. Uh, well, that's good. So, and they're overbearing. They're Greek. They're, you know, <laughs> you gotta be home. You gotta be home. You gotta be home. They're very, they're very close family. So <laughs> they didn't allow me to stay there, even though I did a year and then I came back. Then I went back. I did another year. I came back. Then I did another year. I did. So I do my year, year in LA now. And then finally I was just like, it's not going to work because they're never going to let me live here. So with that said, I just stayed in New York City and I just traveled. You know, com- the comedy scene in New York City is a lot, uh, there's a lot more opportunity to be honing your craft in, in New York than there is in oh, L.A. Yeah, in yeah. L.A., you really can't find any stage time. You have to find mm-hmm. a little dumpy coffee house and if, if you could get stage time in front of like 10 people. So, yeah. you know, New York City and New York has so many comedy clubs, yeah. and they treat comics fair. They pay them, you know, where in L.A. they don't pay you. Uh, Long Island has a great club. I mean, I started in a club called Governors, and I really um, I really wouldn't trade New York comedy scene for any other state 
in the United States. New yeah. York is the best comedy scene. The Absolutely. Best. Yeah, I lived in New York from uh, 2002 to 2009, and uh, I did mostly avant-garde comedy, sort of like the weirder crowds. Definitely not um, definitely not stand-up in a real stand-up place. It was more like, let's do weird stuff. Put pudding on your face. Dance in a circle and sing one word. Like, it was a lot of weird stuff. Yeah, that's weird. That's yeah. Weird. <laughs> but uh, but well, what are your... in New York, yeah. but the thing is, when you do stuff in New York, they don't buy it. They'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're not, you know. So, you know, where another state will be tolerant of it and say, oh, well, he's an artist. In New York, they're like, this guy sucks, Max. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, Man, that, I mean, the open mics are pretty tough, but do you feel like you have uh, a solid community uh, there in New York? You have a lot of good friends that you're working with on the regs? Absolutely. I do have a lot of good friends. We do watch each other's back. We do, you know, recommend each other to other, you know, venues and stuff like that. So it is a, you know, tight-knit community, but there is also a lot of jealousy and a lot of backstabbing, like in everything. Yeah. But, um... But, you know, you weed out, you, you can kind of figure it out after a while, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Now, are you full-time stand-up? Like, do you just perform and that's it, or do you also have a day job? I'm just a full-time comic. Nice. How long yeah, have you been doing that? No, um, I'd say for the last 20 years. Uh, that's yeah. awesome. I'm doing stand-up for 30-some years, so. Yeah, but to I, rock 20 years full-time, that's amazing. And New York is so, full-time. can be really expensive. So the fact that you've done that, I mean, it speaks really well, not only to your talent and, you know, the fact that when you perform places, people like you and they want to bring you back, but that you just have, you know, you have a determination. You stuck with it. You're not like, yeah, let me yeah. try to do something else. You're like, no, I'm doing this. And that's awesome. How do you stick to it? Um, there are times where you're like, you know, because civilian people don't understand what it's like to be an entertainer. So um, you have to try to explain to them the kind of lifestyle you have. It's almost like being vampires. Comedians, I always always think we're vampires. And we're night creepy crawlers. And, yeah. and if you marry a regular person, they don't understand the life we have, but they some, my husband's great with it. You know, we work every night of the week. There's no, you know, so it takes a very special kind of person to deal with a vampire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, a lot of people that, that do get married to regular people, they do get divorced. But a lot of comics pick up with comics, you know. So it's, um, it's a hard life because as a woman, it's even harder because you get thrown curveballs where... You're like, okay, I'm having a baby. Here's a little bit of curveball. Oh, yeah. You know, I got to drive in a car for four hours to get to my gig with a nine month, you know, with a, you know, seven month stomach. So, and then, you know, you, you, like, you know, you have to be there for your kids. You can't be, tra- like, I stopped traveling uh, after I had my kids. So I stayed, always, I always stayed local in the New York area. Yeah. Like, at the most I would go is like Jersey, a little bit of Connecticut, but. Um, so I didn't, nice. you know, you kind of have to stop traveling when you have kids and you have to, you know, where a man can just travel his whole career and his wife will take care of the kids, you know? So yeah. it's, it's a little bit of different, uh, kind of thing with a woman comic. Yeah. I bet you that's not the only issue, uh, being a woman comic. You've certainly made it, uh, made it up in, during the, uh, a time that we are sort of, now discussing has been tough for the ladies. Uh, not a lot of respect. Not yeah. a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people definitely. trying to trying to take advantage. Um, do you think that you've had a, a good experience? Because, like, for instance, I, I, I ask this because I've been doing comedy and theater for many years, and I only realized when the Me Too movement started happening that I was oblivious, that I, I had no idea that anything bad was happening. I am uh, not the first person people are hitting on, so I'm. Uh, I was safe, I guess, and I was just like, "What? People were nice to me," and they're like, "Well, you know, you're you're squishy and nice." They they were just like, "Oh, Amy, she's fine," you know. But I I just I couldn't believe it. Had you? I mean, you don't have to go into detail or whatever, but well, like, look, have you ever I, had I some trouble? Have had, 
No, absolutely. I've definitely had my share of, uh, you know, guys grabbing my ass or, yeah. or not getting paid as much as the other comics and uh, being higher up in the lineup, like where you have the MC mm. feature and the headliner, and then you're finding out that the MC is getting more money than you because he's a guy. Yeah. So I've had that happen, and I've stopped working for clubs because of that. I've had guys grab my ass. I've had a lot of the Me Too movement I've had, but I, I w- I'm a tough kind of girl yeah so i never let anything get to me like that and i i've been lucky enough where i could fight somebody off and i could see where a woman today if if she's not strong can fall prey but i was always like touch me again and i'll break your arm you know i always had that attitude (laughs) that's a beautiful new york attitude i love it but and and then again you know it's like somebody grabbed you know slapped my ass you know, I'm talking about famous comics now. When I'm talking, <laughs> now they're famous, but back then they weren't. You know, like a, um, but that was the way they were. They felt like they could do that because they knew you so well. You know, yeah. they do. You know, they they were kidding around, half kidding around, half you know. But I've never had anything really serious happen to me. I'm I'm grateful and lucky in that aspect. But even just the idea um, that you mentioned about like getting different slots, like you, you, you know, somebody who's a guy get to headliner versus you, or they get paid more. Like those are the oh, little tiny that infractions. Happened, those are that that happened all the time. Yeah, you I bet that that happens today. And yeah. back then, there was far few women, uh, so there was a handful of female comics back then. Yeah, and you got treated like shit. They never put two women on the show because they were like, oh, you know, two women on the show. Yeah. And now there's millions of female comics, and they're funny, and they're hilarious, and they're sexy. They you, they would tell you, you can't look sexy on stage. And they'd be like, really? Why? You got to look ugly. Well, mm. why? I'm funny. I don't have to look ugly. I mean, yeah. I never went on stage with my boobs out or my mini skirt. I always was a tomboyish, but I was a good. But they would tell you, you got to dumb it down. You got to dumb it down. Now you got the hottest women out there doing stand-up, and they're very funny, and you know what? It's time for women to rise in this business because it's been such a male-dominated industry for such a long time. It's like we're done listening to the nonsense that men have to say. Now we want to hear what women have to say, and now's the time we'll talk. Yeah, so absolutely. I only just found out very recently that, like, I didn't know that for real there were more women on the earth than there were men, and I was like, "Well, well, then let's do stuff. What's the trouble?" Well, here's the thing: for every for every five women that are born, one man is born. So that means the earth is trying to shake them off <laughs> on its own, kind of like get rid of them. Yeah, man. Get out it's of a here. Natural, it's a natural, mother nature wants them all. <laughs> uh, I got to tell you, though, if you do stay in this business long enough, you will eventually be the rewards of it. You know, like I just shot my one-hour special. I'm finally getting some, some like, you know, uh, you know, like not props, I guess props, where people are like respecting what I've done for 30 years. You know, yeah, because you put in the time. I did put in the time. Yeah. And Jimmy Winkler said this at the, at the awards, one of the awards shows. He goes, if you sit at the table long enough, you're eventually going to get the chip. So, um, I like that. I'm at the table, and I've been here long enough, so I'm getting my chip. You know? Yeah. But, um, well, that's great. So, yeah, but it finally feels good, you know, where you, you're looked at as, and it's like, you finally get respected for what you've done for so long. Because even your family, like cousins will come up to you and go, so, you're still doing that comedy thing? I'm like, yeah, you're still doing that plumbing thing? Yeah, <laughs> like, right? Oh. You know, it's so funny. It's so funny how they don't respect you until you start making it famous. And they're like, I always knew you were going to be famous. I always <laughs> knew you were going to be unbelievable. Yeah, no, you didn't. And you would always say to me, why don't you get into Amway and sell Amway with me? Oh, man. Yeah, family it's, members it's, are rough that way for sure. <laughs> Well, anything in the arts, I think people always go, oh, it's going to be to roll of the dice. But you know what I got to say? You live one life, you got to do what you love doing. And if you love doing it, do it. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, none of this matters. Because yeah. you're all going to end up in the same situation. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Why uh, we're all going to be sitting in the uh, in the old folks' home together, might as well have better stories to tell, right? Absolutely, if you can remember them. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh my god, that's so true. Oh man. The uh as far as like keeping it going, like what do you do to keep yourself uh, flowing like you have to write so much stand up is probably one of the most crazy art forms because it you know if you were a musician you'd write five songs and then sing those five songs for two years but when you're a comedian you have to come up with new material all the time how do you um, do yeah, that but you, but you you do keep the, the solid stuff you can, you can keep this stuff as long as you once you do a special on comedy you can't keep it anymore because once it's out it's out but you can, you can definitely, um, you definitely write, you write all new bits and you bring them in, but you keep your core of really funny stuff and, you know, and then you just siphon in like new stuff. Like, like I usually write stuff about real life to me. Like when I broke my front tooth, like a couple months ago, I had my front, my front uh, lamin it fell out, and I, I, I go, you know, you go from normal to hillbilly in 30 seconds. You, 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 you're just like you're completely a different person. I don't give a shit if you're wearing Prada. You've got no front tooth, bitch. You know, so yeah. um, it, it's like I write about, I write my with my everyday life experiences, you know. That's so great. So over the years that you've been doing comedy, it's become a bit more of a social media world, a place where now you have to become a brand and put yourself out there. When you had to, because I'm sure at, in the beginning stages of your career, you didn't have to have a website or anything like that or like a Facebook page. When you started yeah, making you those things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I got a business card too. Uh, <laughs> how are you building your brand? Like, I know that that sounds like such a yucky question, but like, you know, you have to sell yourself in a brand new, different way than they used to. Did you change up who you were? Or by the time you made a website, you were like, oh, I know exactly who I am. I'm just going to put myself uh, um, out I, there the right way. Yeah, I, I pretty much knew who, who I am at that point. Um, the, the only good thing about this whole social media thing, which I'm not really um a fan of it because of see what how how damaging it is to children and to kids and what how how vicious it is and how dangerous it is. Yeah. But the, on the upside of this social media, you don't need Hollywood anymore to become famous. You can make it happen on your own. Yeah. Huh? That's a that's a excellent point for sure. Do you know a lot of people uh, like in your circles who are getting picked up off of YouTube um, videos? Absolutely, wow. absolutely. I, I work with a guy named Anthony Rodea. Yeah, he created a little character with a with a face filter called Uncle Vinny, and he's blown up all over the internet. And and I sometimes open for him. And he sells out theaters. And it's all from a little character with a smiley face. If you can look it up. It's called Anthony, uh, uh, Uncle Vinny. And he does his father in an accent. And he's just hilarious. The kid's hilarious. And um, there's so many guys like this now selling out comedy clubs or theaters. But yet, but this, Anthony does have material and stand-up um, background. But... The new guys that don't have any of it, they come in and they do, they're supposed to do 45 minutes and they really don't have 45 minutes because they just have that stupid little character they do on, on the internet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They're not so, ready to do anything more than a three minute video. That's the hardest thing. Correct. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to even distill back to a three minute. Like I'm sure you're doing like full 45 minute sets, like you're saying, and then you have to cut yeah, it down into little hour. snippets so that you can put it on the internet and stuff like that and try to like sell them with like tiny little jokes. Uh, man, yeah. it can be really tough to, to set that up. What, um, if you were able to give advice to new standups who are going to start, um, soon in the industry, what would you tell them, female especially, female stand-up comics, what kind of advice would you give them? Don't take anybody's shit. <laughs> uh, work and write as much as you can. Don't worry about the money. The money will come. Worry about the stage time. Yeah. Hey, right. and, never, and never give up your dream. Never give up your dream. Nice. I like that. That's nice. I'm glad... 
I'm glad for lots of reasons. I'm glad that you're still doing this and that you just said never give up your dream. It was, it's just like there's something heartwarming and great about that. And there's also something really like just wonderful and awesome about the idea that like right now you're backstage waiting to perform. Like you're so yeah. in the thick of it. I love it. I love that you're like so doing it. In fact, when I was trying to schedule it with you, I was like, gosh, she's so busy. Like I want her. I want, I'm like, so excited that you're performing like all the time. Like, that's such a great I know, cool I'm thing. Here. I'm in the green room right now. <laughs> I mean, you're just it's so cool. I mean, I found you on on Twitter. Like the idea that we that social media, uh, you know, I'm I'm a halfway across the country and I'm like, "Ooh, this is an exciting new lady. Let's check it I out." I love it. And it's like we got to connect and figure out what's going on and your advice that was really good advice. One last question before I let you go. Before your last question. Oh, yes, please. Also, tell me whatever. Be kind to the people on the way up because they're going to be the same people on the way down. <laughs> that is so important. That is really important. Yep. Yep. You know what? It's funny because I found that in my life, the people who I know who are doing really well, like in L.A., like some of the people that I did, you know, went and took classes with and did different things with, it's the kindest ones among them that are still doing work. The people who are sweet to even just me who, like, met them when I was 18 or, like, you know, was just a fan. And they were like, oh, thank you so much for coming to the show. And then all of a sudden, like, 20 years later, you're like, oh, my. My God, look at him. Like, it's often the nice people. It's a good thing. I mean, I always tell my film friends that too. I'm like, nobody, you can audition, but you're auditioning to spend two years with them for that film. So you better be fun or else they don't want to hang out with you. That'll, that will come to bite you in the ass later because <laughs> if you are, if you have an attitude, they'll go, you know what? We're doing another project. Should we get her? And you know what? She was a little hard to work with. Yeah. Let's pass her. Especially for women. They go, do that I first. I her, get her, because we had so much fun with her. You know, that's how people don't realize that people have lost gigs from their comments on Facebook. Oh, yeah. Big gigs. Their political status. Yep. Absolutely. What's your last question? So my final question was... Is there an adventure somewhere during your career that you think was sort of a pinnacle moment for you? A moment where, you know, it, it was tough and, and maybe you could have given up, but you decided to keep going with it. Or even just the most fun gig you ever had. Something something fun. I think the most fun I've ever had in my career was when I used to work at the Comedy Cellar in New York City every night. And I hung out with a bunch of comedians. And we made fun of each other every night. And comedy was fun. And it made you want to stay in it. And you may, it made you, like, just love the whole, the whole everything about it. So I think the best time in my career was working and hanging out at the Comedy Cellar every night for 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> it was the best time. That's so great. I would MC. I would, I would respond. And in, those, in that time frame, I met I met. Comedians like, you know, obviously Kevin Hart used to come and hang out and sit down. He was, you know, he was the little Kevin. Um, but I met so many great comedians that would come in and do a spot. Yeah. You know, like Robin Williams. Um, you had um, Dave Chappelle would come in all the time. I mean, there were so many. Yeah. That, you know, you, and you met them and you're like, wow, this is what I, you know, started my career doing. You know, yeah. not doing, but uh, started my career meeting like the greats of the best of the best yeah crazy comedy cellar that's an iconic place so oh, amazing yeah. well good thank you so much for taking the time i hope you have a wonderful set tonight thank and you. all your wonderful gigs this weekend and thank you so much for being on the podcast and talking to me and my audience thank you so much Great. i had a blast oh good Thanks for listening to Yes But Why Podcast. Check out all our episodes on yesbutwhypodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at hcuniversalnetwork.com.